greatest day in history. The tethers be you have rescued me. Sing it out, cause Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. The life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, cause Jesus is alive. Welcome to the Contemporary Service here at Broadmoor. If this is your first time joining us, we hope you have felt the warmest Broadmoor welcome. I want to say good morning to those joining us online. We're going to continue to worship this morning. I want to invite you to say good morning to your neighbor, and we are going to continue to sing. Amen? All right. Blessed be your name, a land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name, when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, 
blessed be your name. And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name. All as it should be, blessed be your name. And blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Y'all sing it out. And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to Broadmoor United Methodist Church. My name's Donnie Wilkinson. I'm one of the pastors here. So grateful that you are with us this morning. Let me uh, share with you a couple of announcements about things that are going on. Our youth group is starting back up uh, this afternoon, 4.30 to 6.30. They'll meet in the youth lounge. Uh, if you have youth or youth adjacent, uh, see Andrea back here. She can give you all of the details and get uh, connected with, with that. Um, starting on September 11th, we're going to resume one of my favorite things that we do here, which is our weekly pastor-led Bible study. Uh, in the mornings at 10 o'clock over in the Adult Education Building, 103, we hold brunch and Bibles, and we have coffee and muffins and some fruit there. And in the evenings, burgers and Bibles. Uh, we got uh, our, our burger crew here. David's a part of the burger crew. Uh, made homemade uh, hamburgers and tater tots. He's already been telling me about all of the, the new accoutrement and, and special spice and blends that he's been, been cooking up uh, for us. The burgers are served uh, right around 5.30, and then we start the study at 6, and we're done by 6.45 because it's a school night, and you've got to get home to take care of uh, bed and bath time and all of that good, all of that good stuff. But I hope that you will pick one of those two times that works best for you and come and do a deep dive in the Gospel of Matthew. For about a year, we've been working our way through the Gospel of Matthew, and we're right at the halfway point 
now and we're going to be journeying on through the end over the course of this year and I hope that you'll come and be be a part of that this time I'd like to invite uh, the kids who want to go to kids breakout they can go back to uh, Miss Andrea age five through fifth grade and while they are making their way uh, to kids breakout let's come together for our time of prayer so I invite you to turn your palms up in your lap gentle breaths just allow yourself to rest in the peace that is God's presence I invite you to begin this time of prayer with gratitude. Give thanks to God for three specific blessings that you are conscious of and grateful for this morning. I invite you to pray for three people that you know. Three people that you feel need a little extra measure of God's grace and goodness in their lives. Ask God to fill their lives with hope and with joy, with love, and with peace. I invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to help you review the past 24 hours. Ask God to give you insight into the, uh, for uh, forgiveness for specific mistakes or sins, places where you missed the mark, and ask for the strength to forgive others. I invite you to pray for one person that you have a hard time getting along with. Ask God to give them insight into their personal problems and to give you the strength to let God's love flow through you to them. I invite you to ask God for sensitivity to the needs of one person that you can show God's love to in word or deed today. I invite you to ask God for help with your personal problems. I invite you to ask God for help in making progress toward your goals. I invite you now to ask God this question and to listen carefully for God's reply. Lord, what do you want to do through me? Gracious God, we thank you. And we ask that you will give us grace to put action to our prayers. We ask that you will help us to know that you are with us and that you will help us to experience your presence in every aspect of our lives. Hear our prayers, for we offer them to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, and to gather all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Just a few moments, we will continue with our worship through the giving of our tithes, gifts, and offerings. Uh, while you're preparing for that, I want to invite those who are assisting with the offering this morning, if they will, to, to come forward. And as they are coming forward, I want to show you a brief little video uh, about all the events, that everything that you helped to make possible this past month in August for our through your generosity so go to videotape
So as you can see, there's a lot going on uh, this past month. There's a lot coming on in this upcoming month. You're one of the ones that makes it possible through your generosity. Thank you. Thank you so much. souls from the darkness if you were able to read it, uh, but in the little video that we showed of stuff, that uh, picture of me holding up the t-shirt, uh, Lexi gave it to me, um, it said, pastor warning, anything you say or do may become a sermon illustration. And so just, even if I'm not wearing the shirt, fair, fair warning, all right? So this morning I want us to, uh, I want us to try something a little bit, a little bit different, okay? just a moment, I'm going to say a word, and when I say that word, I want you to see a face, okay? See somebody who comes to your mind when you hear this word. You ready? Here's the word, conflict. Conflict. Do you see a face? I see a, a face. I see the face of a father, brow 
furrowed, his eyes narrowing as he listens to his brother speak. The words they exchange no longer casual, no longer light. They carry the years of political difference. The room feels smaller all of a sudden. The warmth of the gathering seeping out of the room, dimmed by a cloud of disagreement, conflict. You see a face? I see a face. I see the face of a young woman, hand trembling slightly as she sets down her glass. She loves her family, but the sharp words exchanged across the table cut deep. She looks at her parents who stand on opposite sides of the argument, their voices beginning to rise. She wonders if this chasm can ever be bridged or if this is the moment when their differences become too great to ignore conflict. I see the face of a grandfather, his eyes downcast as he picks at his food. He's seen all of this before. He's seen how politics can poison even the closest bonds. He wants to speak up to remind his family of what's truly important, but the words get stuck in his throat. These arguments have turned his cherished family gathering into something else, something that he hardly recognizes. Conflict. See a teenager sitting at the end of the table, very quiet, trying to understand where all of this anger has come from that suddenly filled the room. She used to think that her family was unbreakable, but now as she listens to the heated exchange, she feels a sense of loss. Harsh tones have replaced the familiar laughter, and she fears that things might never return to the way they were before conflict. See the face of a mother who worked so hard to bring everybody together, now watching in silence as her family unravels before her eyes. The deep, painful divide has overshadowed the joy she had hoped to create. She sees her loved ones retreating into their corners more distant now than when they arrived. Conflict. Word lands like a jolt, doesn't it? You can feel it. Conflict strikes and your body knows it. Breath quickens, heart pounds, vision narrows, stress surges, every fiber of your being on edge, bracing for what's next. But it's not just the body that feels the blow, is it? Emotions ignite, anger flares, hurts cut deep, fear lurks, frustration boils over. These feelings swell, taking hold, steering your reactions, clouding your thoughts. Conflict isn't just a moment. It's a full body, full soul experience that rushes in uninvited, demanding your focus, testing your limits. The challenge lies in finding stillness within that storm, grace within the struggle, peace within the chaos. Conflict, it's just part of life. It touches everyone. It affects our relationships. It disrupts our peace. It's in families and workplaces and nations. Conflict is unavoidable. It's woven into the fabric of our fallen world. We see it every day, don't we? We feel its impact. But as followers of Jesus, we're called to something higher, to something more noble, something more true. We are called to be peacemakers. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 9, where Jesus says something that's both profound and challenging. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Notice what he doesn't say. Jesus doesn't say, blessed are the peaceful. He doesn't say, blessed are those who avoid conflict. Instead, he says, blessed are the peacemakers. There's a world of difference between simply avoiding conflict and being a peacemaker. To be peaceful might mean that you're avoiding conflict altogether, keeping the peace, not rocking the boat. But to be a peacemaker, that is something much more active, much more engaged. Peacemakers don't just keep peace, they create peace. And here's the key. 
Peace isn't passive. Peace is a practice. Peace isn't practice, passive. It's a practice. You see, peacemakers, peacemakers are people who, who step into the conflict, who walk into the mess and bring something different, something that changes the atmosphere. Peacemakers are the ones who build bridges, who reconcile differences, who turn chaos into calm. And Jesus calls us, you and me, to be these kinds of people. Why? Because when we do, we're reflecting the very heart of God. We're living out our identity as his children. To be called children of God means that we bear family resemblance. And what does God do? God makes peace. Think about it. From the very beginning, God has been in the business of peacemaking. When humanity fell into sin, creating a chasm between God and us, what did he do? God sent Jesus to make peace, to reconcile us to himself. The cross, the, the cross is the ultimate act of peacemaking. It's where Jesus took all the conflict, all the sin, all the brokenness, all the chaos of this world and made a way for us to be restored to God. So when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, he's inviting us to join him in his work. He's inviting us, you and me, to reflect his character, his mission, his love. L let's return to conflict for just, just a moment comes in many forms, doesn't it? There's the interpersonal conflict, the kind of those seeds of bitterness between friends and family. There's social conflict, the kind that divides communities and, and nations. Battle within ourselves where fear and, and anger and guilt wrestle for control. And what's the toll of all this conflict? It's heavy. It weighs us down, it breaks our hearts, it strains our spirits, leaves us feeling isolated and alone. And the longer it festers, the more damage it does. We've seen this in the faces I described earlier, didn't we? The father, the young woman, the grandfather, the teenager, the mother. Conflict has a way of turning love into anger, laughter into harsh tones, fondness into contempt, and connection, connection into isolation. But here's the good news. The good news is we don't have to live in quagmires of conflict forever. In and through Jesus, God has given us everything we need to transform conflict into peace. Jesus calls us to be peacemakers. And peacemaking isn't passive. It's not about avoiding conflict or sweeping issues under the rug. Peacemaking is about stepping into the mess, into the chaos, and bringing the light of Christ's love and reconciliation into every place of darkness. Consider Jesus himself, all right? He didn't shy away from conflict. He confronted it head on, but always, always with the goal of, of bringing peace. The woman caught in adultery. You remember that story? When that woman was caught in the drudgery, was dragged before him, Jesus didn't fire the conflict, fuel the fire of conflict. He doused it with mercy. When his disciples argued about who was the greatest, Jesus didn't ignore the tension. He taught them the true meaning of greatness through service and humility. Or think about the Apostle Paul. In almost every one of his letters in the New Testament, he pleads with the members of the churches that he is writing to to reconcile with one another. He begs them not to walk away or allow their disagreement to be an excuse to, to fall out with each other, but instead to work together to find solutions that build up the body of Christ. He was a peacemaker, striving to maintain unity and diversity, and through the Spirit, 
God is calling us to do the same. The same hard work, um, sometimes arduous work, of making peace. Not hoping that peace will happen, but actively practicing the ways that lead to peace. Remember, peace isn't passive. Peace is a practice. Let's bring it home. What does this look like for us today? How can we in our daily lives answer this call to be peacemakers? I'm going to share with you three practices, three very simple but not always easy practices that I can personally attest to have helped me to do this work of peacemaking in ways both great and small. Uh, the first is uh, through what is known as nonviolent communication. It's a great book if you want to, to learn more about it. Marshall Rosenberg is a psychologist, uh, and his basic thesis is that how we communicate can either contribute to peace or escalate conflict. It's about speaking in a way that honors both our needs and the needs of others. And if you, if you just examine your own your own experience, you know that he is on to something here. Our words can either build peace or fuel conflict. You say, why did you do something so stupid? How's the conversation going to go from there? Yeah, it's off the rails. You might as well just go home and just wait till tomorrow and try again. Instead, so the, at its core, uh, nonviolent communication, NVC as it's known, is built on four components. First is observations. What are the facts of the situation? What have you seen or heard that is causing concern? The second is feelings. Remember we talked last week. Feelings, emotions, they are useful data that helps us to be aware of what's going on within us and around us. How do you feel about what you've observed? Are you hurt, angry? Afraid? Something else? The third is needs. What needs are connected to those feelings? Do you need respect? Is it understanding? Is it support? And the fourth is request. What concrete action can you ask for that might help those needs? So here's what this can look like in practice. Let's say you're in a conflict with a co-worker who's constantly interrupting you during meetings. Instead of saying something like, you're always cutting me off, you're so rude, how's the rest of that meeting going to go? What if instead you say something like this, when you interrupt me during meetings, observation, I feel frustrated and overlooked. The feelings. I, I need to feel respected and heard. There's the need. Could you please wait until after I have finished speaking before sharing your thoughts? The concrete request. You see how that works? Now, it, it doesn't mean the person's going to receive it well, but you have not added to the conflict. You've taken a concrete step towards making peace by using nonviolent communication techniques. And I can, as I said, I can attest to you from my own experience that particularly when emotions get hot, to reflect, to pause, to take a breath, and to speak in this way can really bring the tension down and help to work to actually solve the problem. So, so it's all based on this principle that we're referring to. We're not just hoping that conflict goes away. We're working to build peace. Peace isn't passive. It's a practice. A second practice that I have found very, very helpful, particularly in times like we are in in our country right now, is uh, based on this book called Three Practices. Um, a few months ago, I discovered this little way. It's called Three Practices, and you can go to the website and learn a lot more about it. These simple yet profound principles can help us engage in meaningful, respectful dialogue, especially in deep disagreement. The three practices 
I'll be unusually interested in others. The second, I'll stay in the room with difference. And the third, I'll stop comparing my best to your worst. Unusually interested in others, stay in the room with difference. Stop comparing my best to your worst. First practice, unusually interested in others, is about cultivating genuine curiosity. It's about setting aside our assumptions and judgments and being truly interested in the perspectives of others. When we take the time to, to listen deeply, we often find common ground, or at the very least, we understand the other person's humanity more fully. So next time you're in a conversation with someone that you disagree with, instead of preparing your rebuttal while they are talking, try asking them questions to better understand their point of view. Can you tell me more about why you feel that way? What experiences have shaped your beliefs on this issue? And again, I can attest to the validity of this, and I'll share that with you in just a moment. The second practice is I'll stay in the room with difference. I'll stay in the room with difference. It encourages us to resist the urge to withdraw and to shut down when faced with differences. It's about staying engaged even when the conversation gets uncomfortable. Peacemaking doesn't happen by avoiding conflict. It happens when we choose to stay and work through our differences together. So the next time you're in a heated discussion with a family member about a divisive topic, instead of walking away or shutting down the conversation, try saying, I know we see this differently, but I want to understand where you're coming from. Let's, let's keep talking third pillar of the three practices is I'll stop comparing my best to your worst. Third practice challenges us to stop comparing our best with the other person's worst assumptions about the other person. It's about recognizing that we all have flaws and that others like us are often doing the very best that they can. This practice helps us extend grace and see others through a more compassionate lens. So the next time you find yourself frustrated with someone's actions, take a moment, consider their perspective. Instead of thinking, man, they're so selfish, you might reflect, you know what, maybe they're under a lot of stress. I wonder what's going on in their life right now. The three practices are tools that help us to be peacemakers in our daily lives, allowing us to engage in deeper, more respectful conversations and ultimately bridge, build bridges where there were once walls. And as I said, I can attest to the effectiveness of these practices. Many of you know Tom Cook. He was a longtime member of our church, is a longtime member of our church, served as a pastor for a long time. And if you know Tom and you know me, you know that Tom is on any given issue, a click or two to the right of center about on it. And on any given issue, it's quite likely that I'm a click or two to the left of center on that issue. So one day we were riding in his truck and talking about issues and uh, we would have these great conversations and the topic of abortion came up. And I can already feel the anxiety in the room starting to rise just by saying that word. And I, I just read some of this, this material and, and so instead of pulling out all of my facts and figures and da-da-da about it, I, I paused for just a second. And I said, Tom, help me understand how you came. T tell, me the, tell me the story that helped you, that helped shape your understanding of this issue. And he told this beautiful, beautiful story that I'll let him share with you sometime if you're curious uh, about it. And then he asked me what, what my story was about how I came to my position on this story, on this issue. And at the end of the time, neither of us moved off of our positions, but we both knew each other's hearts a little bit better. And whereas for a brief moment, a flicker of conflict had begun to spring up, it was filled with peace. And we rode down Airline Highway in his big truck, friends and brothers, who disagreed with each other, but who loved each other 
because we were willing to do the hard work of being peacemakers in anxious times. The three practices, I encourage you to do it. And if you go to that website, they actually have practice circles where you can get uh, online. They have variety of topics that are there and you can go and be a part of one and practice with other people uh, before you have to go into real into real life and, and do it three practices.com it's a great space third third uh, practical peacemaking tool that I want to share with you this morning again something that I have personally experienced the, the value of it's what I like to call a loving kindness meditation it's a, a form of form of prayer a Christ-centered meditation that focuses on extending love and kindness and warm-heartedness first to ourselves and then to others and then even to those with whom we have conflicts. So here's how it works. You begin by sitting quietly and centering your heart on God's love for you. You might pray something like this, Lord, fill me with your love. Let me know your peace. Then after a few moments, you extend it out, extend the prayer outward to, uh, to people who are friends and family members. Lord, let them know your love. Let them experience your peace. Then as you continue to expend it, uh, extend it outwards, you, you pray for a neutral person, somebody that you, it's the person that you see at the store every week, the person that lives in your neighborhood but you've never had a conversation with, just somebody that you see regularly. You don't feel good or bad about them. They're just somebody that you pass by in your life, and you pray the same for them. Lord, let them know your love. Let them experience your peace. And then you extend it out even further towards somebody that you have a hard time getting along with, a difficult person in your life. Lord, let them know your love. Let them experience your peace. As I was, uh, as I was driving in this morning, uh, the thought occurred to me and I just offer it to you do it don't do it it's up to up to you but for those of you who know that you are going to vote for Donald Trump in November I invite you I challenge you to pray this prayer for Kamala Harris for the next 70 something days and for those of you who know that you are going to pray, uh, vote for Kamala Harris in November pray this prayer for Donald Trump for the next 70-something days. Look, you're not praying for them to win, okay? You're praying that they would know God's love and experience God's peace. And in a little way that has a cumulative impact, you're being a peacemaker. You're being a peacemaker. You know, it's the kind of prayer that transforms our hearts. It helps us see others not as enemies or obstacles to dominate, but as beloved children of God, just like us. It softens our hearts and it opens the door to reconciliation. Remember, peace isn't passive. It's a practice. And we live in a world filled with conflict. It's everywhere. But as followers of Jesus, we're called to something greater. We're not called to resign ourselves to living in quagmires of conflict. We are called to be peacemakers, to step into the chaos with love and grace of God, to bring healing and hope where there is hurt, to build bridges where there are divides. Peace isn't passive, it's a practice. And Jesus says, those who practice peace will be known as what? Children of God. Now imagine what would happen if we took this call seriously. Picture your home as a place where peace reigns, where conflicts are met with understanding, where forgiveness flows freely. Imagine our workplaces transformed by the presence of peacemakers, where collaboration replaces competition and respect is the norm. 
vision our community united where people come together to build bridges not walls this is the life that god calls us to this is the life of a peacemaker and when we embrace this calling we reflect the very heart of god we become in truth his children living out his love in a world that so desperately needs it so i challenge you today take that first step toward making peace start in your heart in your home in your circle of influence be the peacemaker god has called you to be and trust that as you do you will see god's peace peace that passes all understanding begin to fill your life your relationships and your world blessed are the peacemakers for they for you will be called children of God in just a moment we're going to come to this table where we experience the reconciling love of God, the love that God shows us, the way, the lengths that God was willing to go to show, to make peace with us. We remember that this meal uh, points us to the truth of the cross, the place where the scripture says that in Christ's body on the cross, he had set aside uh, all the hostility of the world and reconciled us to God. Through the cross, God has made peace with every one of us, with you and with me and with all of the world. And when we receive the bread and drink from the cup, we experience anew the peace that God has given us. And so I remind you that on the night when Jesus gave himself up for us, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood, the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink this cup, remember me. So God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for making peace with us and for your invitation to be peacemakers in this world. Cleanse our hearts. Help us to know and experience your love and grace through your son, Jesus, so that we might extend his peace into the world. Hear us now as we unite our voices in the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen